Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship with the people of Emmanuel in this place. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, friends, on Zoom. This is the time when we gather and we share information and announcements with each other. Are there folks in the room who have announcements to share? Well, before I make my announcement, I have to make a PSA. Aaron Judge, Aaron Judge returned to the Yankees Friday night. <laughs> and last night he hit a home run, but that's beside the point. Um, uh, uh, August 26th, Saturday night at seven o'clock, bring your tap shoes and your dancing shoes because we're gonna have a celebration in music uh, right on the steps with, uh, the choir and, and various guests singing. Um, people from Emmanuel at camp, um, both of the first two weeks, that's good. I don't have anybody going this coming week, but I think I've got a few going for the week number four, which is the last week. Um, we do have an issue, and so this is kind of a, a prayer request. Um, on, on Friday, um, I got a call. <laughs> that the septic wasn't working. You know, it's because a couple weeks ago, we didn't have water coming in because the tanks, there was a leak and the tank emptied. And I said, don't worry, staff, no water is not a problem because we can still flush, we buy bottled water to drink, we're fine. It's when the septic goes out that it's a problem. Yeah, but um, so, um, you know, as luck would have it, uh, I've got some, some good people who know our system. I've got an electrician who we've had in a relationship with for maybe 35 or 40 years. He was out there. Um, we, st we have septic to part of the camp, but not the rest of the camp. Hopefully we can get the pump rebuilt. You know the story. Um, septic, what a stinky issue. Anyway, pray, pray that, um, Pray that my staff can stay calm and can handle this with humor. Pray that the um, health inspector doesn't come until this is resolved. There's a big prayer. Um, and just and pray for the staff and the campers who are coming this week. We've got 20 coming. Good morning. I just wanted to reiterate what is in the bulletin. September 10th, bring your appetite because we are having a potluck homecoming slash gathering or AKA formerly known as homecoming Sunday with a meal. Thank you. A lot of people stepped up and and did the announcement that I was going to, but I also wanted to highlight um, the upcoming trip to uh, Georgia and Alabama for civil rights. Um, that's planned for President's Week in February. And we just completed a poster describing it. It's in the Fellowship Hall, but the glue isn't even dry yet. Otherwise, I'd bring it in and show it to you. Uh, but take a peek at what, that's, uh, what that looks like and where we're going. Are there friends on Zoom who have announcements to share? I apologize because I was having technical difficulties, so I do not know if this was already mentioned, uh, but this is our last Sunday in this space before August 12th, which is uh, the day that we are sharing together at Pathfinder. Does somebody already talk about that? Okay, thank you. So. Um, there's lots of words describing it on the back of your bulletin. I'm not going to read those to you, but but today is um, a great opportunity to sign up for that if you want to come, especially if you need a ride. Um, the sign-up sheet is in Fellowship Hall on the table under the whiteboard, 
And um, maybe someone might bring that into this space because more of us will be in here for the meeting probably than in Fellowship Hall. But sign up for that. Um, talk to me or Marilyn if you have questions. Talk to Marilyn if you want to spend the night um, in a cabin into the next day. And I would also remind you that next Sunday is um, our second focus service. So we will be worshiping at Trinity at 10 a.m. or online. That is all of our announcements. Let us prepare for worship. Oh, oh, it's not all of our announcements. <laughs> Sorry, the technical difficulties took over my brain. I wanted to welcome uh, Reverend Dr. Jim Kelsey to worship with us today. Jim is our uh, executive minister. I don't really need to introduce him. I had to wait in line to get to talk to him because so many of you already know him and wanted to have conversation with him this morning. So Jim, would you come and just say hello? Good morning. And hello to our radio audience. I've always wanted to say that. It's great to be with you. I thought I had a Sunday uncommitted, and I thought, well, I will go visit my friends at Emmanuel Albany. It's always great to be with you. And I'm also, by providence or luck or fortune, I'll, I'm interested to be here with your meeting today because I think what you're thinking about doing is really quite future looking, you know, very much is embracing the reality that's already around us. And so I'm interesting, interested to see how you will move ahead with that and how that will work. And this, this could be a model for other churches that we have in our region. If you do it and, it and it's successful, it goes well, that could embolden and encourage others to, to go where you are going now. So it's great to be with you and I look forward to worshiping and hearing Pastor Donnelly's sermon. Thank you, Jim. And now, let us prepare for worship.
Let's pray together. Loving God, our friend, savior, and healer, we hear your invitation to rest. And we bring our burdens to you because the world is too big for us. The degree of human suffering too great, the tangle of cause and effect too complex. So prayerfully, we place before you a tiny segment of humanity and ask that you bless them well. And then as you bless them, please bless all the other people whose needs are beyond our knowing. We pray for the world you created and all the creatures who share it with us. We hold before you places of political unrest and violence, joining our hearts with those who are suffering in Haiti, Niger, Myanmar, Ukraine, and Venezuela. We hold before you Antonio and his family. We hold before you Bill, who is doing everything he knows to do. We pray for a planet that is groaning. We grieve for fish that cannot breathe in oxygen-starved waters. For people and animals whose homes are being destroyed by floods and fire. For those who have no escape from the unrelenting heat. We pray for wisdom and courage that we will act together for the good of all creation. We pray for Libby and her family as they recognize the end of her life and grieve for that. We pray for James and his family navigating a crisis for Cal, who is coping with the side effects of several new medicines. For Betty in rehab. For Kendra and Reeves and Bessie in the transition of moving with all the decisions and all the unknowns. We give thanks for Ed's good and continuing recovery, for family gatherings and 50th anniversaries and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We give thanks for the opportunities and the beauty that is this season. God, our rock and our redeemer, we seek your strong presence. Renew our joy. Let us abound in hope. Give us courage and strength and desire to press on. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen. When I look at Emmanuel Baptist Church, I see a congregation whose spirit of generosity and compassion is as strong as it was when I arrived here 13 years ago. I see a church that has been through a difficult season, but is rallying with the courage and the creativity that I have come to associate with you. Despite what some of you might think, I do not see a dying church. But I do see an uncertain one. 
I see evidence of widespread weariness and a lack of a clear vision mixed with some grief and fear. And I see a church and a pastor who might be ready to internalize these words of Jesus as we never have before. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus himself is weary and frustrated because the same leaders who rejected John the Baptist for being too uptight and demanding are now rejecting Jesus for being too easygoing. They just can't seem to understand the deep peace that he wants to impart. There's no way to win with these folks. And it is exhausting. And so I am wondering what might be exhausting us right now. Maybe it's big worries like the heating up of the planet or the possibility of another worldwide pandemic. Or maybe it's close, personal concerns about a family member's health or navigating a life crisis or a bank balance that just will not cover this month's bills. Or having to avoid the danger zones every time we just try to have a simple conversation with a friend or a family member because everything is controversial right now. And what might be wearing us out as Emanuel Baptist Church? Maybe it's wondering when the next major building crisis will hit and how we will manage it. Or investing energy and time into planning programs or activities which are not well attended or appreciated. Or always feeling like we're letting someone down whether it's the lonely older adults isolated by health concerns or the younger generation who seem more anxious and less supported than many in recent history. Or maybe what's wearing us out is continuing to do church tasks for which we have lost the passion because if we don't, who will? Those are some of my thoughts about why we are weary as individuals and as a congregation. You probably have others. Making the list itself can be overwhelming. I often remind myself about being good tired versus being bad tired. Some of you are nodding. That's something that I learned from the folk singer Harry Chapin, who learned it from his grandfather. Chapin's grandfather was a painter. He died at age 88 after illustrating Robert Frost's first two books of poetry. And one day, toward the end of his life, he said to his grandson, Harry, there's two kinds of tired. There's good tired and there's bad tired. He said, ironically enough, bad tired can be a day when you won but you won other people's battles, you lived other people's days, other people's agendas, other people's dreams. And when it's all over, there was very little you in there, and when you hit the hay at night, somehow you toss and turn, you don't settle easy. Good tired, ironically enough, can be a day that you lost. But you fought your battles, you chased your dreams, you lived your days, and when you hit the hay at night, you just settle easy. You sleep the sleep of the just, and you say, take me away. He said, Harry, all my life I wanted to be a painter, and I painted. God, I would have loved to have been more successful, but I painted, and I painted, and I'm good tired and they can take me away. 
So I wonder if we are bad tired because we are living other people's dreams. Measuring ourselves against a previous generation's definitions of success. I wonder if we are so weary because 150 years ago, having a large, beautiful building was an essential part of being church in this community. But now, this big, beautiful building feels like a heavy burden. And I wonder if we are weary because we keep trying to sustain all the programs that were started by other people when we were three times our current size and needed to meet the needs of all those people. I wonder if we are bone tired because we have started acting as though we are indispensable to God's work. When deep down we know that we are merely one of countless participants invited to join the work that God is already doing. Two weeks ago, I had a Zoom call with the Reverend Kara Root. She's the pastor of Lake Nakoma's Presbyterian Church near Minneapolis. That is the church which practices Sabbath together every other Sunday. That's where I got some of the ideas for the proposal, which we're considering in the meeting today. Kara was very generous in sharing her time and her church's story with me. And then this week, I read her book and came to understand even more. When they called Kara as pastor in 2008, no one new had joined the church in seven years. There were no children. On a good Sunday, maybe 30 people worshipped in a sanctuary that used to hold 300. And they thought that their endowment might last two years if they were very frugal. By the time they called Kara as pastor, they were prepared to die. But they said, if we are dying, we are going to go down swinging. And if we're not dying then we are going to discover what we were meant to do and be now. That was 15 years ago. They are still alive. They've received many new members. Their largest constituency now is families with young children. They don't have much endowment left, but they have enough money to pay the bills, and they give away at least 10% of their pledges and loose offering to support other expressions of God's ministry elsewhere in the world. I share all that because those are the questions that you will ask me because those are the typical ways that we measure church vitality. But what I find more remarkable about this congregation are the internal theological shifts that they have made. By facing their prospective death, they came to the deep conviction that the church is God's not theirs. They say this is not our church to maintain, our ministry to build, our project to do, or our legacy to pass on. This is God's ministry. Live or die, we belong to God. So we are free to be whom God has called us to be and leave the survival question to God. Could that really be true? What if we are free to be whomever or whatever God calls us to be, and we don't have to worry about whether Emmanuel lives or dies? Friends, that sounds like an easier yoke to me. But it also sounds unrealistic and hard to sustain. Two years after that church made a major change in their worship life as a way of being who God called them to be, they went on retreat together. And on this retreat, they asked themselves, what is keeping us from noticing what God is doing and joining it without hesitation? What unspoken fears or beliefs are still holding us back? So they brainstormed. 
and they agreed on four big underlying uh, assumptions. First, they said, our glory days are in the past. We are, and then they said, we are too small, too old, and we don't have enough money. And they said, if you volunteer for something, you will be stuck with that job for life. They actually realized that they had a pattern where some people in the church had quit the church in order to quit their church job. And then they said, a few people do all the work. I just wonder how many of us might resonate with one or two or more of those. So they sat with these for a while, and then they said to themselves, what is the opposite of each of these fears? And so they said, the opposite is, God is doing something here and now that incorporates the past and leads us into the future. I can see that. You can't see that. Sorry. <laughs> and then they said, uh, the opposite of number two is we are exactly the right size. <laughs> I think there is a, there are people at work. Okay, I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, the second one they rewrote as we are exactly the right size and makeup and have the resources that we need for what God wants to do in and through us. And regarding number three, they said, every person participates from their particularities and passions. And regarding number four, can you advance this slide? And regarding number four, they said, we all share the ministry of the church. And then they came home from the retreat and they put up that second list, just the second list, in their fellowship hall, the space that everybody gathers in with the title, Guiding Our Guiding Convictions. They didn't believe them at first. They didn't believe that these were their guiding convictions. They felt like phonies, but it was a way to remind themselves to keep living out of trust instead of fear. And it worked. Because a few years ago, someone who had recently joined the church, someone who wasn't there when on this retreat, said, I just love looking at those they describe us so well. It didn't happen right away, of course. They had to deal with the things that they had learned about themselves, including that people felt stuck in their church jobs. So now, at the annual meeting every year, the newly installed leaders make a pledge. I'm sure they have lots of good Presbyterian language for this, but then this church has added this sentence. Those taking on new responsibilities promise, I will serve out of joy and only as long as it brings me joy. I will serve out of joy and only as long as it brings me joy. Well now, that sounds like a much easier yoke. But what happens when the moderator resigns because they can no longer serve with joy? What if there are not enough people willing to joyfully teach children Sunday school? What often happens is that the church gets anxious and pressures the nominating committee to fill all the empty slots. And then some people wearily agree to serve out of obligation or duty. 
But what if we promise God and each other to only serve from a place of joy and we meant it? Wouldn't that be a real exercise of trust, a way to act out our belief that the ministry belongs to God and that God will provide what is needed for the ministry that God wants? That's what Lake Nokomis did. They once went 18 months without a clerk of session, which is what they call a moderator. They went 18 months without that person until someone stepped forward. Someone who sincerely felt called and ready to serve with joy. It happens that the person who stepped into that role had quit the church because they wouldn't let her out of her job in the nursery before that. Jesus came with good news of abundance. He shared the presence of a creator who has blessed the world with good gifts, beauty and wonder and grace, enough for all if we share. But there's a competing story that swirls around us. It's a story of scarcity, the fear that we won't get enough, that we aren't enough, that somehow we might die outside the presence and love of God. And when we attended that story, we start scrambling to do whatever it takes to keep the fear at bay, and we get weary. But Jesus invites us into a life of trust, a life yoked with Jesus, moving as Jesus moves at God's direction. We are called to share the good news of abundance with others. That's not particular to us. That's the calling of everyone who accepts Jesus' yoke. What is specific to us are the ways we share, the people we share with, the particularities and passions that make us who we are, and the ways that assortment of gifts and people combine to be the unique expression of the body of Christ in this place. Friends, you have been asked to consider a major change, a change in mission priorities which will change our worship life. I believe that God is calling us to share the good news with people we haven't met in ways that seek to put their needs before our own. And I believe that you have call, heard that call as well, although you might disagree with the particular methods that I suggest in the proposal. I remain open to your decision on that. But as we discuss and discern our way forward, my most fervent hope is that we will act from a place of trust and courage. I hope that we will remember that Emmanuel Baptist Church belongs to God first, last, and always. I pray that we will accept Jesus' invitation into a yoked life which relies on God's abundance and isn't driven by our fears of scarcity. I know I make you nervous when I suggest that people might stop serving. This is not a call to abandon our post and go eat bonbons on the beach. There is a yoke and there is work to do. But I think that if we submit to this yoke, if we can learn to practice deep trust together and to leave the questions of survival to God, then we will become our most authentic selves. And at the end, we will be good, tired, and they can take us away. Amen. Our closing hymn is called as Partners in Christ's Service. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. I invite you to rise in body or spirit.
want to invite you to stay in this space for um, the meeting, but I'm also looking to Jean. Are there any other instructions? Okay, so I'm assuming we will convene pretty shortly after the postlude. So friends, would you receive a benediction? May the Lord Christ go before you to prepare your way. Christ beside you be companion to you everywhere you go. Christ beneath you to strengthen or sustain you when you fall or fail. Christ behind you to finish and complete what you must leave undone. Christ within you to give you courage and hope, faith and love. But mostly Christ above bless and keep you now and evermore. Amen. Thank you.